Hello, ladies, men, and non-binary friends, and welcome back to my kingdom. Ah, the angsty boy. I, like many young humans enthralled with sci-fi, fantasy, and post-apocalyptic franchises, have fallen prey to the rather infamous angsty boy. My love of angsty boys is difficult to describe. Maybe it's my savior complex, maybe it's my attraction to broken men. The angsty boy is a weakness to many, and frankly, it's easy to see why. They are mysterious, they almost always have long flowing hair, they're dark and sensitive, artistic, misunderstood. They usually have a tragic backstory or a troubled childhood. A rough exterior, but with good intentions and a heart made of gold. They're often far more appealing than the main character, in my opinion, because their whole thing is that they're unique. They're an outcast. They're different. The angsty boy shines in comparison to any basic protagonist, but like any trope in cinema or television, there are good and bad portrayals. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in. Have you ever seen me without the stupid hat on? That's weird. <sighs> Let's deep dive into some of the best and worst portrayals of angsty boys in our generation, starting with the king. Prince Zuko of the Fire Nation is perhaps the most well-written character in television history. If you've seen Avatar The Last Airbender, I'm sure you know why. For those of you who haven't, what, what, what the hell are you doing? Well, the first season of Avatar is questionable at times. I, lo I love the series, but the first season, is, is it, it doesn't really stack up to the rest. There are some pretty pivotal scenes that set the tone for the rest of the show. Most of these scenes are incredibly tragic, juxtaposing with the show's quirky and comedic characters. Avatar The Last Airbender never really lets us forget that this world is at war, and never hesitates to show just how broken this world really is. We all know that Atla is an amazing show, and that Zuko is a fantastic character, but let's really dive into the why. What makes him so great? Why has he resonated with so many people? How did he become one of the most memed, but also the most beloved characters of our time? Let's discuss. When we meet Zuko, he's portrayed as this grumpy, power-hungry teenager with a temper who's obsessed with finding the Avatar to restore his... Honor. 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 Honor, yeah, he mentions it a few times. He's pretty flat at this point, and we don't have any sympathy or remorse for him. He attacks the Southern Water Tribe, the home of two of our main characters, and we find out that his people, the Fire Nation, are responsible for the death of Katara and Sokka's mother, and all of Aang's people. Zuko is the prince of an oppressive regime, a regime that's obsessed with conquering the world. So far, not really heartthrob material. Until we watch The Storm, Season 1, Episode 12. Against Iroh's judgment, Zuko chooses to sail his ship through a terrible storm, hoping to gain some ground on the Avatar. This leaves the crew at risk of danger, and Zuko makes clear that he doesn't care. Finding the Avatar is more important than any individual's safety. The crew is obviously not pleased with this, so they talk shit behind his back, and Iroh catches them. But it's no hard feelings because Iroh knows that Zuko can be difficult, so instead of reprimanding them, he explains why Zuko has so much rage and how he got his scar. And we get a flashback scene. Cue tragic backstory. Now, before this episode, we're told that Zuko got his scar from challenging a master. And at the time, we presumed it was a result of a foolish act done out of his own brash rage. Because that makes the most sense based on what we've seen from his character. Zuko gets mad at everyone. It would make sense that he would say something out of anger and get his ass whooped for it. But during the flashback, we see Zuko as a young prince, eager to serve his country and learn everything he can before becoming Fire Lord. He accompanies Iroh into the war meeting with the most senior military officers of the Fire Nation, including the Fire Lord, Zuko's father. When an older general speaks of his plan to use the newest recruits for their army as bait for their latest invasion, sacrificing them, Zuko speaks up, alerting his distaste for the general's plan. He calls out the general for using his forces so carelessly and purposefully sending these young soldiers to their death. This is admirable. This young child in a room full of adults knows that this is a cruel act and that it's wrong. Zuko is clearly in the right here, but his father doesn't see it that way. Zuko's father says that his son's behavior was an act of disrespect against the general and that the only way to solve this was through an Agni Kai, a fire duel. Now, Zuko was under the impression that he would be fighting this old ass general, so he accepted and stood behind his words. But because Zuko challenged the general's plan in the Fire Lord's war room, he disrespected the Fire Lord and would have to duel his own father. He doesn't want to fight his father. He doesn't want to go against his family. All he ever wanted to do was make him proud. His father looms over him and Zuko literally says, I won't fight you. Zuko begs his father for mercy. Zuko apologizes. This kid is weeping in front of this crowd of royals and generals and advisors, just wanting all of this to go away, feeling so guilty and ashamed. 
The Fire Lord shows no mercy and strikes Zuko, burning a scar over his left eye. He then banishes Zuko, decreeing that he never come home until he has captured the Avatar. At the end of the story, the crew feels really bad for Zuko, and we, as an audience, look at him in an entirely new light. He didn't choose this. He never wanted this life. Near the end of the episode, back to the present, the storm damages the ship. Zuko sees the Avatar, but decides that repairing the ship and saving the crew is more important, so he lets the Avatar go. This entire flashback, his behavior in the war room, sticking up for the soldiers without a voice, only hoping to make his father and his country proud, all of this optimism, this goodwill, this well-intentioned objection comes from a pure place. In this scene, we learn that Zuko has the capacity for good and that this life of hunting the Avatar was not his choosing. It's truly his only way back home and the only way to gain back his father and country's respect. When the audience learns this about Zuko, it plants the seeds of everything to come. For the rest of the show, Zuko struggles with defining his destiny. He struggles between good and evil, growing up in an oppressive regime that he knows is wrong, but this same regime is the home to anyone he's ever loved. There are certainly some obstacles along the way, but he eventually chooses good, joins the gang, and helps them defeat the Fire Lord. I could talk about Zuko's journey for hours. <laughs> There's plenty of other fantastic creators who have already done that for me. But for now, let's focus on the fact that he goes from this... Excuse me. Jesus Christ. Something just fell off my wall and I almost had a heart attack. All right, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Holy fuck. But for now, let's focus on the fact that Zuko goes from this... Shut your mouth, you water tribe peasant! ...to this... My first girlfriend turned into the moon. That's rough, buddy. Thankfully, it's not a stark transition. The show makes sure to take its time with Zuko's path to the light, which makes it all the more convincing and is one of the many reasons why this show is the gold standard for storytelling. He really is a tortured person, torn between everything he's been taught and everything he's learned on his own. I've learned everything, and I've had to learn it on my own. This old, rigid world from his past and this new, unknown world of his present. It's really f***ing beautiful. On top of this beautiful character arc, he's also a straight-up hunk with a raspy voice, dark flowing hair, and deadpan humor. He is truly the whole package. You happy now? I'm never happy. So let's go through the checklist. What makes Zuko a good portrayal of the angsty boy? First, his tragic backstory, his rough exterior, we are shown his capacity for good. He is emotionally conflicted between right and wrong. He accepts the consequences and responsibility for his wrongdoings when he finally joins the light. He is a straight-up hunk, dark flowing hair, introverted, hilarious deadpan humor. This is everything you want to see in a good, angsty boy portrayal. We need to see his capacity for good. We need to see that emotional conflict. There's a difference between an angsty boy and a straight-up villain. <laughs> Both are fine, but there is a distinction. At the end of season two, Zuko is at a crossroads, and we're led to believe that he can have a happy ending and be the good guy, but the show takes that away from us. Eventually, he gets that back, but it's a journey. He goes back to the Fire Nation and realizes it's not what he wanted. Even though he has everything he's been striving for, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Zuko is comforting to so many viewers because he personifies the sentiment of, you'll probably mess up before you get it right. Eventually, he finds his way, he makes the right choice, but he fails a lot. Like, a, a lot before he gets there. You're going to fail a lot before things work out. Even though you'll probably fail over and over and over again, you have to try every time. Seeing a character like this on screen is affirming and comforting and beautiful. Long live Fire Lord Zuko. Now, this one may not be everyone's favorite, but it's certainly one of mine, and in my opinion, one of the best uses of character out there. This movie does so much in such a small amount of time with Warren, and it's... it's beautiful. Sky High as a movie has an exceptional use of character. I can't say enough good things about this movie. It was one of my favorites growing up. I still watch it as an adult, and it's one of those comforting, nostalgia movies that I could just watch anytime. It's a fun family film about superpowered teenagers that go to a superhero high school. Very enjoyable, highly recommend. If you haven't seen it, it's on Disney+. Plus. Check it out. Now, let's get down to business. War and Peace. This guy. I mean, just look at him. He perfectly fits the bill for Angsty Boy. More importantly, he's written really well, like exceptionally well. This character is in the movie for probably 25 minutes and he's more likable, interesting, and actually nicer than our protagonist. That's kind of a first. All props to Steven Strait here. I mean, he honestly killed it. He's exceptionally charming and funny. I have so much respect for him in this role. 
In the beginning of the film, Warren is vilified for his parentage because his mother is a hero, but his dad is a supervillain, put in prison by Will's father. That's our main character. And people make assumptions about Warren because of this. I'm sure he's been teased at Sky High because his father is in prison. We don't see this firsthand, but it's certainly implied that he has his own reputation and a bit of a temper. When Will runs into him and buffoonishly mentions that Warren's dad is in prison, this understandably upsets Warren. What? Nobody talks about my father and he fights Will in the cafeteria. At this point, Will doesn't have any powers, spoilers, but when his friends are threatened, his adrenaline kicks in or something and he gets super strength, fights back Warren, and the two end up spending detention together. This leads to them being arch enemies, as Will describes, which is just hilarious because Will, dude, you're like 14, relax. The two of them are chosen to fight the main bullies in the story during a game of Save the Citizen in gym class, which essentially is capture the flag, but with superpowers and only four players. They don't really work that well as a team because, well, they hate each other. Warren's feelings about Will don't really change after this, but Will does save his life. Warren walks off kind of grumpy and embarrassed, but they do win the game. However, when Layla gets stood up by Will at the Chinese restaurant where Warren works, there's a softness to him. He's much more relaxed now that he's outside of school. The expectation is gone. His tough guy persona falters and he feels bad for her. You want me to eat that up for you? You're not supposed to use your powers outside of school. I was just gonna stick it in the microwave. He asks her how she's doing, he makes her laugh, he gives her advice, and he's all around just very sweet. Honestly, these two should have ended up together. Will is a dud and I stand by that. There's so many angsty boy tropes that are overdone or underbaked and most of the time these men tend to be emotionally constipated or manipulative, using their trauma as a means to control others, usually women. Thankfully, we don't see this from Warren. He's not a character who's constantly reminding us that he's a lone wolf. I don't fit in and I don't want to fit in. To let true love remain unspoken is the quickest route to a heavy heart. That is really deep. And your lucky numbers are 4, 16, 5, and 49. Oh yeah, did I mention how absolutely charming? I mean, who gave you the right, Warren? Who gave you the right? He eventually agrees to go to homecoming with Layla after she's blown off by Will again and bands together with the sidekicks at the end of the movie to stop royal pain. He and Will become friends and he joins the crew. It's a really cute ending. Oh my god, and he starts dating the girl with ice powers, which is also just like adorable. Warren is very clearly my favorite character in this movie. He's easily the most interesting in my opinion, and he seems to be the only character aside from Layla with truly good and honest intentions. I would love to learn more about his family. How did his parents meet? What went wrong? When did his father turn bad? And how did that affect him? Unfortunately, it seems like we'll never know, but anyone who's a fan of this movie has probably created their own head cannons on Tumblr, so I recommend popping over there if you're interested. Let's hit the checklist. Tragic backstory, rough exterior, we are shown his capacity for good, accepts consequences and responsibility for wrongdoings, straight up hunk, dark flowing hair, quiet, and uh, deadpan humor. Yeah, that pretty much just checks all the boxes. I would also like to make clear that you can write an angsty boy that goes bad. It can be a compelling and gut-wrenching story to see someone struggle between good and evil and ultimately fail. But like I said, there's a difference between being an angsty boy and a literal villain. <laughs> if you're writing an angsty boy, it's imperative that you showcase their capacity for goodness. Otherwise, they're just a bad guy. Now that we've established what a good angsty boy looks like, let's move on to the less convincing examples. <sighs> All right, I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this, but Draco Malfoy is a bad guy. Not an angsty boy. I'm telling you, this guy is just a straight up villain. Harry Potter fans, I shouldn't say all of them. Some Harry Potter fans are falsely equating Draco to being a misunderstood angsty boy when in actuality, he's just kind of a d But many fans think that he has the potential to have that heart of gold because he holds the other traits of an angsty boy. But here's the thing, Draco hasn't put in any of the work to be beloved. There are so many fans that just assume the best of Draco because his father was mean to him and he has a good relationship with his mother. But we never actually see Draco doing anything kind or selfless until the last movie? Kind of? It's just... Ugh. Let's take a look at Zuko again. I know it's not necessarily fair to compare the best written character of all time to a blood supremacist edgelord, but just hear me out. Zuko's entire arc is his struggle between good and evil. He wants to do the right thing, but for so long he's struggled to define what that really is. He tries so hard to be good. We see him struggle and fail and try again, but the point is, he's making an effort. His intentions are almost always good. This is very clearly not the case for Draco Malfoy. Sure, there's something to be said for being raised under certain circumstances, but Draco is just like actively sh 
to people, like, all the time. He does things outside of his blood supremacist logic that he knows is wrong. Let me give you an example. We know Draco's family hates Muggleborn wizards, so naturally he's awful to Hermione, as she is indeed Muggleborn. However, He's also terrible to Neville Longbottom, a pure-blood wizard. If his bad behavior was only directed towards Muggleborns and he was perfectly nice to everyone else, I could kind of see where you're coming from as being a product of his circumstances, but when we as an audience witness him being an absolute dick to everyone, it's pretty difficult to hold any sympathy for him. To all my ladies, men, and non-binary friends who are attracted to Draco Malfoy, please don't actually date anyone like this. I know Tom Felton is cute in these movies, but seriously, stay away from people who act like this. I realize that some of you are adults, and I probably won't have to spell this out, but for those of you who are younger, if you ever meet anyone that acts like this and thinks it's cool, run. Sprint in the opposite direction. If this is how he treats other people, how do you think he's gonna treat you? I might be taking this more seriously than I should, but television and cinema are notorious for glamorizing toxic male behavior and I just want everyone to be safe. Okay, love you, bye. That being said, the potential for a Draco Malfoy redemption arc was always there. JK could have gone through with this. It's one of the many, 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 many problems I have with her books. But she didn't. Create your own headcanons if you like, in fact, I encourage you to. But can we please, please stop romanticizing the canonical version of Draco Malfoy because he's seriously a piece of sh**. He was built that way, I don't know what to tell you. <sighs> I don't really know where to start when I talk about this sequel trilogy. There's a lot to unpack here. For those of you who don't know, this trilogy had a slew of different writers and directors who all had a different idea of where the sequel trilogy should go, and they didn't stick with any of them. This led to a lot of incongruence in storytelling and character, and as a fan of Star Wars, this was really frustrating to see. There were so many different points in the series where I held out hope, I thought they were going to turn it around, and it never f***ing happened. There was just too much petty bullshit behind the scenes, this series should have been done with one writing team and one director. It wouldn't have been perfect. I'm sure people would have complained regardless, but you could have at least had some semblance of a cohesive story. Alright, let's talk about Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren is both good and bad, and I think that's fine. If I'm being honest, Kylo Ren was definitely the most consistent of any character in these films, including our main heroes. Now, this doesn't mean that his arc was good, let me be clear, but it does seem like the writers took the most time with Kylo's character. It's just disappointing to me because his arc could have been so much more convincing, but these assholes couldn't decide on a singular plot for anyone, so fuck me, I guess. I was really disappointed by Kylo Ren's character development in the sequel trilogy because he had so much potential. We spend a lot of time in this series trying to establish that Kylo Ren is a bad guy and that he wants to be bad and he does all these bad things, but there's traces of light in him so he can be good, I guess? We don't actually see him do good things. There's a few moments where he sides with Rey, but this is usually done for his benefit. But in the last movie, he gets stabbed, sees the ghost of his dead father that he killed, by the way, and he just decides to be good, like, at the very last second. We don't really have any concrete evidence that Kylo Ren has the potential to be good. It's implied that he feels this pull to the light, but the only actions he really takes in the trilogy are serving himself or the dark side. He never apologizes to Rey or takes any responsibility for his actions and wrongdoings. He's tortured Rey, hunted her friends, and killed countless people right in front of her, but for some reason, she has this ridiculous notion that Kylo Ren should just be given a chance? Like, what? <clears throat> Sorry. I like that Rey is written as this very pure character, someone who isn't corruptible. I like that she's really powerful and kind, but she's not dumb. I mean, why would she believe this? Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I guess I can understand that. But look at her first interaction with Finn. He hasn't even really done anything to her, and she's ready to kick his ass. But this guy has committed unspeakable evils right in front of her, and she's like, no, I'll give him a chance. Order them to stop firing. There's still time to take the fleet. It's time to let all things die. The Sith, the Jedi, the Rebels, let it all die. We can rule together and bring a new order to the galaxy. Don't do this, Bill. Don't get me wrong, there was so much potential for this story. I really love the idea of a Sith being pulled to the light, a dark warrior feeling conflicted about his path, torn between good and evil, but they don't do anything with it until the last half of the last movie? They should have started this sh way earlier. These lazy attempts at 
character development quite literally ruin franchises. It's one of the many reasons why everyone hated the last season of Game of Thrones so much. We're just supposed to, within a few episodes, believe that Dragon Lady Bad, when at every turn before that, she's proven that she set herself apart from her family and tried to be a good person. I will not attack King's Landing. We will not attack King's Landing. <laughs> There were so many opportunities for Kylo Ren's allegiances to shift, even in subtle ways. I mean, his mother is the head of the Resistance for God's sake. There would have been plenty of opportunities for him to get involved in the Resistance. He could have been a spy or something, I don't know. That would have been cool. There could be a scene where he tries to apologize to Finn and Poe, but gets all embarrassed because he's a Sith Lord and he's never had to admit his faults before. That would have been cute. We could have had a moment of tension on the battlefield where people don't trust him because he's used to fighting for the other side, so he has to prove himself and wait, I'm... I'm, I'm just talking about Zuko now, aren't I? Yeah, I, I can't help it. This is the gold standard. Wasted potential was a huge problem for pretty much every character that we were given in these films. I saw the first movie and I was like, damn, I can't wait for them to explore this more. And it was like the directors heard me say that and replied, we hear you, but we're actually just gonna f around in space for nine hours with a pin thread plot and you're just gonna have to deal with it. Hello, editing me. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I made this super crystal clear because I feel like I kind of danced around it in my initial explanation in my initial recording. I just want to make sure that this sentiment comes through super, super clear as to why I'm not a huge fan of Ben Solo's arc. It's not a satisfying transition and it feels unearned. I have no reason to believe that Ben talking to his father would make him change his ways. It's not like it's ever worked before, him talking with his mother, it, it, didn't, it, it didn't really do anything to change his morals at all. This is not a logical transition. I guess it's possible because anything is possible, but this redemption arc seems completely unearned. The writers were not prepared for this transition, and even if they were, it, it was not properly shown. My theory is that the initial writing team were like, because they introduced the idea of Ben Solo being kind of called to the light and Leia being like, oh, there's still light in him, I know it. They sort of, I, I guess, I guess planted that seed fine, but then were expecting to be able to elaborate on that in the second movie, then weren't able to do it because Ryan Johnson went in a different direction for whatever reason. And then they had to kind of rush through it and rush through any sort of possible development that they had planned in the last movie. So it just, they had a destination, but they didn't properly plan the journey. Does that make sense? The reason why I have a problem with it is because, like I said, it seems completely unearned. We're just supposed to believe that Ben Solo came to this natural conclusion that, okay, now's the time where I need to switch to the light. Now's the time for me to be good. When we haven't seen him, like I said, we haven't seen him do anything that's selfless. He didn't kill his mother once. I wouldn't say that that's a selfless thing. I just think that that's not an evil thing, you know? It, it, he hasn't done anything truly, truly good. He hasn't done anything worth redemption. The writers, I guess, just decided that, okay, this is the point where he's just gonna be good. And I'm sorry, but I just don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all for me. Um, back to the video. I'm personally fine with any fan fictions or headcanons about Kylo Ren because it's probably better than what these idiots came up with. Fantasize all you like about how he's misunderstood because in my opinion, he's not even a fully formed character in these movies. This is a situation where I think it's fine to assume things about him based on his angsty boy trope because we weren't really given enough with the source material. Sometimes it's our job as the fans to fill in the blanks. There was so much that could have been done with Ben Solo and like the rest of the characters in these films, they deserve better. Like I said, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. In the end, angsty boys are a fun trope that most people can get behind. They're a fun addition to any team and often contrast well with the optimism and pure heart of the protagonist. I've always had a soft spot for these kinds of characters, as I'm sure many of you do too. It's a nice feeling to see someone struggle between good and evil and ultimately choose good. It makes for a compelling story where there's opportunities for team building and character development for everyone. It certainly helps that most angsty boys are practically formed by the gods themselves. Oh yeah. So why do we as a society like angsty boys and tortured characters in general? What about these characters resonates so deeply? I'm sure every person on the earth has struggled with feeling like they don't belong at some point in their life. 
It's very easy to feel alone and like no one understands what you're going through. When I'm in that state of mind, I feel weak and isolated, powerless, maybe even unloved. But characters like this help me feel strong again. They show me that you can feel all of these things and still be a hero. You still have a place and you are still loved. For those of us who don't always feel like the main character. For those of us who feel like we're behind or that the world is stacked against us. For those of us suffering in silence. For those of us who suffer from emotional or physical trauma or from mental illness. It seems like these characters are written for us. Not everyone is a squeaky clean protagonist that triumphs easily. Some of us have had to struggle and fight, and that's what has made us strong, cunning, and empathetic leaders. I've been delaying putting out a new video because I want to make sure it's up to your standards. I'm so excited to have all of you here. But when you all came at once, I was legitimately freaking out and getting in my head about it. I want to say a big thank you to all of my new subscribers. Y'all just came out of nowhere, huh? I'm really happy to have you here. I hope you enjoyed me talking about angsty boys for a little while, and if you've made it this far, you're a real one. Who are your favorite angsty boys? There's honestly hundreds, maybe thousands of angsty boy characters in cinema and TV combined. I'd love to hear your favorites in the comments as I'm constantly looking for new shows and movies to watch. Also, let me know if you'd like a part two. Like I said, this is one of my favorite tropes and there are so many angsty boys out there and I'd love to kind of dissect the good portrayals and then maybe not so great portrayals. So yeah, if you'd like a part two, let me know. I would for sure do this again. This was super fun. As always, thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye.